Visionary is proud to present his 21st season on public television. Sometimes you read the paper and watch the news, and it seems like there's more bad news than good in the world. But you know what? It's just not true. I at least can hold on to something, that there's something, that it, maybe it's small, but there's something that I'm doing to make a difference. It's just a feeling that you have. You can help people. You have to. There's no alternative. Every child has potential that we just can't know. And so to my mind, that's what we're doing. We are saving potential for the future. Cooperation, the act of two or more people voluntarily working toward a common end, is the essence of a free and democratic society. A hundred years ago, a group known today as the National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA, was formed as a vessel to hold and promote the stuff out of which cooperation is made. They are called the seven principles, like democratic control, training and education, and commitment to community. The National Cooperative Business Association is the apex organization of U.S. cooperatives. We are unique in that we create a table where they all come together and we find our common co-op principles and we celebrate those principles. Then we go and advocate on behalf of co-ops in the U.S. economy and around the world. We take you now across America to see these concepts in action and reveal the profound change that occurs when the motive for work and profit is mutual benefit not corporate greed or individual wealth. Co-ops have a shared history with the great social movements of the last century. In 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on his way to Marx, Mississippi, where he was to lead the Poor People's March on Poverty. His voice still resonates today in the opening of a new co-op that could help fulfill his dream. It's such a wonderful time here in Marks, Mississippi. The Blues and Muse Festival is going on, and it is the celebration of Martin Luther King's journey from Marks, Mississippi to Washington, D.C. I'm so excited to be here on behalf of the National Cooperative Business Association to help celebrate this very momentous occasion. Well, this is the inaugural uh, Mule and Blues Fest, and uh, I have to stop and think about how to pronounce that. We've got about 50 vendors here today, music all day. We had music last night, we danced, had a wonderful time. The Mule Train was a concept that Dr. King came up with back in 67, but it started in 68 to show the nation how poor and underprivileged the people were here in Putman County. This was his last planned journey, but he was, of course, you know, killed April 4th. Mule train rolled in May. And I had the opportunity to speak with several folks yesterday at the cooperative market yes. about their experience on the mule train. I think I was about 14 at the time, 14 years old. We left from the museum right here in Marx. It was exciting at first. I didn't know really what it was about. It was just exciting. I was very young. I was about 18 when the mule train got started here in Marx. Dr. King had come before that and was getting ready to start this Poor People's Campaign because he saw so much hunger and need here in this particular place. So much so that it brought tears to his eyes and he cried. It was phenomenal, uh, but the history has been kind of buried right here in Marx. Yeah. And now this history is coming out to the larger country even. And we are believing that Marx will be part of the civil rights route through the South, you know, with Selma, Birmingham, Montgomery. This is a very, very poor county. 
you, you're aware of this, probably one of the poorest counties in, in Mississippi. And that's one of the reasons why the Poor People's Campaign started here 47 years ago. And there's been some progress made, but it's still much to be done. And so we need resources. We need people to come and invest in this community. Co-ops serve such a diverse group of people. And there is a strong and powerful pull to using co-ops to empower the lowest income folks. And we have a long history working through the civil rights uh, movement in the United States to take that power of co-op ownership to those that are disenfranchised or poverty level to see if they cannot use that to sell their produce. We know what economic hardship is. And it's not just in the black community, it is in all communities. Each one understands that our future is not separate, it's together. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Rosalind Wilcox. Yeah. We have a cooperative market here from, with Shreveport Federal Credit Union. Uh, there is an ideal that has caught breath across the South with vendors coming in and setting up where they don't have to own their own building. They're able to come into a, into a, um, a building that someone else owns and they rent a space. This facility here is a co-op. It's a co-op of farmers coming together and selling their produce and then people who, you know, do sewing on the side or do canning of fruits and vegetables and come and sell to the community. The people can communicate to bind together and do things together. That's why I said a co-op before. As a cooperative, we come together and share our expenses and uh, we meet other folk. You may even learn some new trade by sitting beside someone else who's doing something different than what you're doing. As we looked on a cooperative arrangement, you're saying, okay, I do embroidery and you grow cabbage. If I had a cabbage store, nobody probably would come, or maybe one or two, but if I'm side by side with your embroidery and then you grow an okra and so on, we can come to one place. So I think that's what co-op can do better than other financial institutions because uh, we all bring all our resources together to expand the opportunities for, for all folks in the community. You know, you can't measure that in terms of the impact that it has on a local community. And it, uh, it starts these uh, small businesses off uh, on the retail side. There would be businesses that would have an opportunity to go and be a part of the marketplace. And then when they get ready to occupy one of these empty facilities, uh, they'll be more prepared and be for success. It's all about economic development. It's all about giving right. a hope. Six years ago, I purchased a home medical equipment business uh, that was already located here, but was on the brink of closing. And I gave up my teaching job, gave up a paycheck, and uh, dove into a business. And uh, six years later, we're still here on Main Street. The market that we've established here will, will draw some people, but I think we're near the home of the blues. That's just 15 minutes west of here. We've got the University of Mississippi just 45 minutes east of us, and we think that sandwiched between the two will be a good getting off place. commerce to the Absolutely. area by bringing people from all the way from Memphis and New Orleans to Marks. To Marks, That's Mississippi. Amazing. And it's all surrounding the beautiful history of Martin Luther King starting his mule train march to Washington, D.C. from Marks, Mississippi. Another kind of co-op is one in which the owners are the workers. In western Massachusetts, we see two stories. One about the simple power of clay, and the other pickles. Real pickles. We're heading uh, north on Interstate 91 in western Massachusetts. My partner and I actually moved out to this region specifically because we wanted to be in a place where there was not only a vibrant local food scene, but also a lot going on in the cooperative movement. Hi everybody, I'm Sarah from the National Cooperative Business Association, Clusa International, and I heard that this game 
pretty much describes how cooperatives work in the funnest way possible. One of the things that's most exciting to me about the cooperative model is that it really can be used for any kind of economic or social purpose that you're looking at. And I think TESA, the Toolbox for Education and Social Action, is a great example of that. So TESA is a worker cooperative, so in this case, uh, the members of the cooperative are the people who work together to create educational curricula around social change and uh, the cooperative movement. Cooply was a project that I had started in college. It was supposed to be like a 30-minute scenario about like how co-ops work and what it's like to be in one, and then it kind of spiraled out of control into a game. So this is Real Pickles. Uh, this was started by Dan Rosenberg and Addie Rose Holland a number of years ago as a naturally fermented pickling company. And in the past few years, they've turned to a worker co-op. In here, you'll see some of the exciting potential for co-ops in local foods development. So let's go in. For thousands of years, people all over the world used natural fermentation to make pickles. And that process went by the wayside when the food system became industrialized. This is our kitchen where we process all of our fresh vegetables and get them ready to start fermenting. There are a lot of health benefits associated with raw fermented pickles, the traditional way of making pickled foods, and I was really interested in bringing that food back to the American diet. These are carrots from uh, Atlas Farm in Deerfield, Massachusetts. Uh, it's about seven miles away from our facility. Uh, these are really beautiful carrots today. The vegetables and fresh spices that are in this barrel are all from local farms here in the Northeast. So we're washing the carrots here, uh, putting them into bins to get them ready for chopping the tops off, and then weighing them in bins so that we know exactly how much carrot is going into the barrel. This is a barrel of ginger carrots in the midst of fermentation. This is where all the magic happens here. Ginger carrots is one of about 12 products that we make. Um, we make carrots, sauerkraut, kimchi. When we say real pickles, we think of pickles as a whole array of different kinds of vegetables, not just cucumber pickles. So this is where we're mixing the salt and the uh, pureed ginger into the shredded carrots, trying to mix the salt and the spices in so that it's a, uh, a homogeneous mixture. The most important difference between fermented pickles and modern vinegar pickles is that with fermented pickles, you end up with a rich array of active cultures and enzymes. Just like yogurt, it's a probiotic food that offers an array of health benefits. Heather's been here for two, two and a half years. Two and a half years. Um, I'm really committed to the local food movement. Um, I've been working in it for about seven years uh, in different capacities. And I was really struck by Real Pickle's social mission and the commitment to the local farms in the area. Over here, we have our Hobart shredder where we shred all the carrots, and CJ is shredding today. Uh, CJ is a, he's been here for a little over a year, and he's considering worker ownership at Real Pickles. We're, we're really excited about it. I just see like a lot of the core values of the culture here at Real Pickles is just, it's great. It's very, you know, it's very diverse. Uh, we tend to focus on what really matters for us in the community. And um, I like to be a part of that a lot, you know? And um, it's just something I want to teach my kids in the future, you know what I mean? So several years into Real Pickles, uh, Dan and I started thinking about where, what direction the business was going and how we wanted to make sure that we were preserving this mission that we had built over the years. The emerging trend for existing small businesses to sell to their employee captures the spirit of cooperatives. Co-ops are local by nature, and if you have a small business person who has built that business in that community and has served the community, when you've built something, you want to hand it over to somebody who cares, and often the people that care most are those employees that help you make it a success and continue to run it. So the people who are here with me now, Brendan and Tamara, are both worker owners. This is where we do all the sort of administrative work. Um, we have somebody who does marketing, sales, um, finance. I feel that one of our primary roles as owners of the business is not only to direct the business forward, but to really educate 
the employees who are thinking about becoming members. So much of the reason that we wanted to be a co-op was to make it an appealing workplace and make it somewhere that people really wanted to stick around and be part of. Yeah, I'm all the time looking at people in the kitchen and thinking, oh, I hope that they'll join or it'd be really cool to have them on board. Um, and I'm still learning about the co-op, so it's neat to be in this middle situation where I'm learning from the founding members of the co-op and then I'm passing that on to the newest workers in the kitchen. Being a worker owner for me means that I have the opportunity to participate in discussions and policy development here at Real Pickles that affects me personally uh, and also affects the way that our mission is carried out. We're in year three as a worker-owned cooperative and we continue to grow at double digits year after year and I think a big part of our success as a business in the last few years um, relates to the fact that we've become a cooperative We've really seen workers become more invested and think big picture, thinking like owners, and I think that's really translated into a, a stronger and more successful business. Well, what's powerful about the cooperative model and why I think it's such a, a good match for businesses like Real Pickles um, is it takes the, the creativity, the entrepreneurship of a sole proprietor and sort of spreads that ownership and control and input across the business and sort of roots it among those people who either work at the business or depend on it for products or services or it's where they shop. And so where you might see a successful business, it's got a popular brand, people see it growing, the route that people assume an entrepreneur wants to take is to sell it for as much money as they could get. But in my experience, that's not what a lot of young entrepreneurs are looking for. They're looking for impact. They're looking for mission. They're looking to benefit their communities in the long run. And so for me, that cooperative model is uh, an obvious step to take in terms of a conversion. A cooperative is a corporate structure in which the customers are the owners, like in a co-op grocery store. But there are other extraordinarily entrepreneurial endeavors organized as co-ops, from a funeral co-op to one of the region's biggest financial institutions. So this is where it all began for BECU. It did. We were founded by 18 Boeing employees in 1935. They each chipped in 50 cents and started the credit union with $9 in assets. The first loan was for $2.50 to help a Boeing worker buy the tools they needed for work. And what those folks realized that by working together, they could solve problems that they could not do on their own. Today, BSU is a not-for-profit, member-owned financial cooperative. While we serve many Boeing employees, we're not a part of the Boeing company. We have over 900,000 members. The biggest difference of working at a co-op versus a bank is 100% of the focus of the organization is on serving the member. In contrast, on the bank, you have both a member, a customer, and a shareholder that you're trying to serve the purposes of, and sometimes they don't intersect. So instead, on the cooperative side, 100% of our energy, whether it's at the boardroom, at the executive offices, or at our teller front line, is focused on serving and creating a remarkable experience for our members. So principle six is cooperation among co-ops. How does that manifest at BECU? We see that as a very powerful principle. It allows credit unions, it really creates a platform for innovation and scale to allow us to better serve our members and communities and strengthen the entire cooperative movement, much more so than we ever could do acting as an individual co-op. Yeah. I also like the way that you interact with the community and give yeah. benefit to other people. That's a big part of who we are. We are at Express Credit Union and Express Advantage in Seattle, Washington, and I get to be the CEO here. This credit union is a credit union that serves low-income people. So we are standing here in the home of Express Credit Union and the nonprofit Express Advantage. I sit on the board and chair the board of the nonprofit side, and I'm supported in doing that with my role at BECU because BECU is a major supporter of this effort. Express has a unique model that's a very hand-to-hand, high-touch model that 
we aren't able to do directly, but we're able to do by helping them financially in order to help further that model. The customers that we get here at Express are usually a mixture of people. Um, it can be anywhere from a middle class individual all the way down to somebody who's in poverty at the same time. So it's a mixture of people that we get here at Express. Both entities are about getting people through the pathway of financial resiliency. The payday alternative loan is a loan that helps them do that. A payday alternative loan is like a signature loan for people who need emergency money atop from their paycheck and we don't pull credit for that. All we require is for them to have direct deposit for six months with us. Of course, you, they don't have to have good credit to apply for it, um, but they're building credit as they um, pay off this loan. Part of the mission of a cooperative is serving our, both our membership and our community. So to the extent our members are part of the community, they also want to live as part of a community that's healthy, vibrant, and, and, and growing. The community teller is a unique thing that we do here at Express Credit Union. And they go into social service agencies and the City of Seattle's Financial Empowerment Center. Then they open accounts. They're available for people in the communities where they live. You are looked at as an equal equally important member of the credit union as regardless of your financial picture and that changes the dynamics of how a person is served because it's about trying to meet their needs where they're at and not trying to make them be where we think they should be for our benefit it's how can we be of benefit to each person and their needs all right so we're here today in the central co-op we have thirteen and a half thousand member owners uh, we specialize in natural, organics, uh, fairly traded, and just ethically sourced products. Uh, a lot of local products as well. That's a big emphasis here. We have about 130 staff members. We have the highest entry level compensation of any grocer in America. So we have a $15.36 entry wage that's set to go up in a month uh, to even more. Uh, and also we have full coverage on health insurance at 28 hours a week worked plus family coverage. So there's really no groceries doing quite what we're doing with regards to labor. I've been here uh, for about a year and a half and um, I was originally very terrified to get into hourly work because uh, I hadn't had an hourly job in about five years. Here I feel valued. Everyone who works here from your maintenance janitor all the way up to the general manager, everybody's really invested in each other. Well, as you can see here, we're in the middle of a special election. Really a historic moment for the co-op. It's a fundamental change in the way we operate our co-op. Right now, we're a single class cooperative, so consumers own the whole business. With this model, we would be a 50% worker-owned, 50% consumer-owned cooperative. And that's really a significant thing in the day and age when wealth disparity, income disparity, and uh, instability and employment are affecting people's lives in dramatic ways. What we're doing here, in its own way, uh, is addressing those larger scale issues. And really, that's what it's going to take to change things. It's a lot of individual firms that take this on. So how did you get started in the funeral business? Well, I unfortunately uh, experienced a few too many deaths at young ages of my peers and I saw that the funeral process was so difficult for the families to deal with and I felt there must be a better way because dealing with someone's death is hard enough without throwing the difficulty of making funeral arrangements into the process. So why did you get into a cooperative funeral business as opposed to just any other funeral home? Well, it made more sense to me. Uh, a cooperative funeral home is owned by the members, and so there's no one profiting off of services at that time of life except for the people who need the services. I came in contact with People's uh, Memorial Association through my husband's illness. He had brain cancer and was dying and we were making all of his arrangements and at the same time my own and a co-worker told me about People's Memorial. I was looking for a funeral home or a place to arrange for cremation that wasn't going to rip me up. How did 
this idea come about here in Seattle for a funeral co-op? I mean, what, what got this started? Well, it was actually a group of churches that got together and they were really um, upset with the high cost of dying and their members were going bankrupt to pay for funeral arrangements for a loved one and they thought there needed to be a better way. There needed to be simpler options. And so this group of congregations got together and approached one funeral home in Seattle and said, we'll send all of our members to you if you give them discounted rates on funeral services. You don't upsell them, you only give them what they want and you're gonna offer this newfangled thing called cremation. And that relationship with that one funeral home lasted over 60 years. And then that funeral home was bought out by a funeral conglomerates. I do know what the motivation of a for-profit funeral home, their motivation is money. People's memorial motivation is not money. It's about servicing their members. That's a, that's a big distinction. And they decided that they have between 75 and 100,000 members. They have the numbers to form a cooperative funeral home. So they didn't have to worry about the corporate takeover the co-op's model really allowed us to not be focused at all on the expense because we already knew the pre-set arrangements and, and how fair and reasonable they were and that we understood that the co-op wasn't here to make money, it was here to serve the members and we were members. And so in the midst of our grief, the co-op model allowed us to have confidence that what we're there to consume, if you will, would be handled appropriately and easily without thought great uh, sector for co-ops because really at the core it's all about a respect for the dignity of people and reciprocity in our relationships and there's no time it seems more appropriate at the end of life really. Exactly and the services are for the people who most benefit from the existence of the co-op. For the visionaries I'm Sam Waterstone. Visionaries is brought to you through the generosity of the Anna Maria and Stephen Kellen Foundation, CoBank, the Catholic Communication Campaign, National Cooperative Bank, the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut, and Eco Serendi Villa and Spa of St. John, and also by Capital Impact Partners, City Foundation, H.J. Promise Foundation, and PNC Bank. Additional support was provided by the following.